The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As part of the third cycle of discipline, there were some articles that came out today Concerning the state of our economy, one comes from CNS News by Terrence P. Jeffrey. The number of Americans who are 16 years or older and who have decided not to participate in the nation's labor force has pushed past 90 million for the first time, according to data released today by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The BLS counts a person as participating in the labor force if they are 16 years or older and either have a job or have actively sought a job in the last four weeks. A person is not participating in the labor force if they are 16 or older and have not sought a job in the last four weeks. In July, according to the BLS, 89,957,000 Americans did not participate in the labor force. In August, that climbed to 90 million 473,000 in one month, an increase of 500,000 persons, 516,000 to be precise. In January 2009, when President Barack Obama took office, there were 80,507,000 Americans not in the labor force. Thus, the number of Americans not in the labor force has increased by 9,966,000 during Obama's presidency. Uh, tomorrow, you'll probably turn on the news and hear about the unemployment rate dropping to 7.3%. It's all smoke and mirrors. These are the true numbers. Here's another article concerning our third cycle of discipline. Before I go there, by the way, all of the million jobs that they say have been created in the past five years uh, seventy percent of them are part-time jobs and for a point of reference in history during the Ronald Reagan administration one month in 1984 there was a creation of one million jobs and they weren't part-time we're talking over five years they're ballyhooing one million jobs most of which are part-time Again, smoke and mirrors, peace and prosperity, when there is no peace and prosperity. Here's another article. Payrolls in the United States climbed less than projected in August, and gains in the prior two months were re revised down, indicating companies are being deliberate in their hiring as they wait for a pickup in demand. The unemployment rate unexpectedly fell as more people left the labor force. The addition of 169,000 workers last month, which by the way does not keep up with population growth, you would have to have 300,000 per month to just keep up with population growth. So the unemployment rate is going upwards. The addition of 169,000 workers last month followed a revised 104,000 rise in July that was smaller than initially estimated. Labor Department figures showed today in Washington that the median forecast of 96 economists surveyed by Bloomberg called for an August increase of 180,000. CNBC's Rick Santelli reacts to the August jobs report, which revealed that the lowest proportion of Americans for decades 
are part of the workforce. Quote, you can't hide this millions of people forever, he said, and you can't play this three-card Monty game for long. To see the stock market rally on crappy data to me is just a horrible dynamic. What are we, a banana republic? End quote. As part of what comes after the third cycle of discipline would be the fourth and fifth cycles of discipline, all of which we will study in detail coming up. It is biblical, and while some of the things that I say concerning the third, fourth, and fifth cycle of disciplines might be outside of your frame of reference, there's no reason to mock it or to say it can't happen. The same things were said before 9-11, and 9-11 happened. These things can happen just because they're outside of our frame of reference because we've never experienced the fourth and fifth cycle of discipline does not mean that they cannot happen or will not happen. And when it does happen, since it is outside of our frame of reference, it will come as a shock to every American. Well, we seem hell-bent, or at least those in power seem hell-bent on getting us into a war, an unnecessary war, a silly war, and they're treating it like a video game as if we can plop a few strategically guided missiles in a couple spots and walk away and there will be no repercussions. That's not how the world works. That's how video games work. The world does not work that way at all and if you just think about it, if somebody launched some missiles our ways and strategically attacked our weapon systems, we would call that war. But John Kerry said that's not war. What we're doing is not war. That's a lie. That's deceit. It is war. And the Russians know, it, know it's war, so here's an article concerning what the Russians have started to do as I speak this day. Russian landing ship Nikolai Filchenkov is reportedly headed to the Syrian coast as tension in the region continues to escalate. The deployment of another vessel by Moscow, a key ally of Damascus, comes as the United States considers unleashing a military strike against President Bashar al-Assad's regime. The vessel will dock in Novorossiysk, where it will take special cargo on board and head to the designated area of military service in the eastern Mediterranean, an unnamed naval source told Russia's Interfax news agency. The nature of the car cargo is still unclear. The vessel has a capacity for 3,300 troops, 1,700 1, tons of cargo, including 20 tanks. It is protected by three guns and three missile launchers. Ahead of the movement of the large vessel, vessel two Russian ships pass the Bosporus Strait in Istanbul en route to the eastern stretch of the Mediterranean. Russia had earlier sent new warships to the region shortly after America announced it would intervene militarily in Syria as retaliation for Assad's chemical attack. Moscow has been threatening or strengthening its Mediterranean naval fleet over recent months, although the country insists these are regular maneuvers. This is an older article. Now they do not. They say they are doing it for the purpose of attacking the United States. Russia also has a naval maintenance facility in the Syrian port of Tartarus. And uh, Putin warns Russia could come to Syria's aid over the United States strike. Here's another article from Fox News published today. As he touched down in St. Petersburg on Thursday morning, President Obama gre greeted his host, Vladimir Putin, with a handshake and a smile. But the cordial, cordial greeting belies the tinderbox the two leaders are sitting on as they posture and deliberate over a potential United States strike on Syria one of Russia's closest Mideast allies. Putin escalated concerns about the fallout from any strike when he indicated in an interview published Wednesday that his country could send Syria and its neighbors in the region the components of a missile shield if the United States attacks. U.S. General Martin Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified this week that the Russians might even replace any military assets the U.S. destroys in a strike. The warnings raise the possibility of a supposedly, quote, limited strike on Syria, bringing in a proxy 
tit-for-tat war between Russia and the United States. Representative George Holding of North Carolina went further during a hearing on Syria on Wednesday, pressing military officials on what the United States would do if Russia decided to strike at us in that theater. Quote, we can certainly say that Russia would have options to strike us in that theater, either in, retali in retaliation for us striking their ally, he warned. And then uh, they went, go on to say that uh, they, Russia has capabilities that range from the asymmetric, including cyber, all the way up through strategic nuclear weapons. So here we are getting ourselves involved in a conflict that we don't need to be involved in while we have at the very top leadership that doesn't understand peace or war or anything common that is related to common sense or life. Well, we're studying freedom and that's just to give you a glimpse of what's coming in the future. I don't wish it, but it could very well happen. Now, since the human concept of freedom includes the right to possess, enjoy, benefit, or make a profit from the acquired things of this life, the true concept of property, it would be wise for us to once again go over the Ten Amendments to the Constitution. And this not only provides freedom, but also the rule of law, which holds freedom in its place and keeps it from degenerating into a system of anarchy. It also expressly limits the federal government in such a way as to keep the ambitions and machinations of demagogues to protect the people from a system of tyranny. It is recognized from our na national heritage in the Constitution that a citizen has the right to make a profit and possess both and to possess personal and real property. Ownership means any valuable right or interest which can be considered as a source of wealth. It is profoundly amazing that men of genius of all walks of life, from the writer to the public speaker, to the scholar, to the scientist, to the inventor, they all came together in one place at one time in history to create a document that reflects divine establishment principles. It was no mistake that they all came together at one place at one time, for one specific providentially ordained mission. It's no fluke of history. They came together as part of God's providence to create this client nation to God, these United States of America. We are a country set apart to God, as it were a holy nation, not Christian, but filled with all sorts of beliefs. Our freedom is so broad that from the atheist he can shout, there is no God, to the Buddhist who is free to meditate, to the Muslim who is free to kneel toward Mecca, to the Christian who is free to not only believe in Christ, but profess his faith in Christ, disseminate the gospel of God's word, and to teach God's word without threat of harm. America is a place where Jewish merchants sell Zen love beads to agnostics for Christmas. As God blessed us and our national power grew, a missionary from a tiny town in Georgia or a large glistening city in New, in New York could travel the world and give the gospel, set up churches in faraway lands with minimal threat of harm, for America was respected in the world. We became a shining city on a hill. Nothing like it had ever been seen. So much so that when asked what was the greatest accomplishment of Great Britain, none other than a British, British Prime Minister quipped, America. People from around the world, from every walk of life, from poverty stricken to the rich seeking more wealth, to a family in Russia escaping the horrors of communism, to the poor Irishman who smiled, displaying proudly a mouth filled with ragged, darkened teeth, as his ship came into sight of the Statue of Liberty, to the European Jews seeking asylum from anti-Semitism, who could now erect a temple and chant, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. No, America is not a fluke, 
a simple mistake of history, as if history is like a hamster playing on his wheel, going round and round with no objective. No, history is linear, and it is made up of you and me. We are now the current events of history. We are not here simply to run in vain, and as a Christian, it is your responsibility to run the race toward an objective. By doing so, your influence on history, your influence on this great country becomes far greater than the human influence of any politician. By failing to run the race, you become an enemy of this blessed country. That's why America is entering the fourth and fifth cycles of discipline. We can't blame the politician. We can't even blame the unbeliever. We can only blame ourselves for not taking seriously the greatest freedom ever, spiritual freedom. For many believers have traded in their spiritual freedom for a mess of pottage straight from the bowels of Satan's cosmic system. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9.24. 1 Corinthians 9.24. 1 Corinthians 9.24 and following talks about a race. A race that we're all in. The moment you believed in Christ, you were entered into this race, and we all start in the pole position, first place. We all have the assets and the availability of assets. We have the gym at hand for free. We have a free trainer, your pastor. You have a free teacher, God the Holy Spirit, who teaches you these deep things. You have everything available to you to run this race. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? That's tantamount to all believers have been entered into the race. But only one gets the prize. That means few believers will receive the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. In other words, utilize the two power options constantly. Verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. This means that the plan of God has a precise method of execution, hence the protocol plan of God. During these games that the Romans brought back as a Greek tradition, they had to go through all types of protocol. They could not drink wine. They had to play in the games naked and running too. They had to lather their bodies with oil. They had all sorts of protocol that they must follow, and if they didn't follow the protocol, they were immediately disqualified. If you don't follow the protocol plan of God, you are immediately disqualified. In other words, if you don't rebound, or if you've rejected 1 John 1, 9, which means to simply name your sins to God, and you say, no, it's more than that, I've got to feel sorry for it, you've disqualified yourself from the race. But you were entered into the race, You'll just stay at the finish and start line. So the plan of God has precise method of execution, hence the protocol plan of God. The verse continues, they do it to get a crown that will not last. That is, the Romans who participated in the race, they did it for a crown and other things that went along with it, such as no income tax, etc., and the praise and approbation of man. But none of that lasts. And even for you, you sports fans, believe it or not, sports is temporal. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. It's imperishable. So the importance of living your life in the light of eternity comes into focus. Those things that are most valuable in life are those things that will last forever that will go through all the four great judgments that are to come. 
26. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. That means believers who do not understand God's protocol for the church age. They don't understand the utilization of the two power options. They don't understand the power of God the Holy Spirit, the power of metabolizing Bible doctrine, the utilization of the ten problem-solving devices, the execution of the adult phases of the unique spiritual life. They just run aimlessly, always learning, but never able to come to an understanding. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air, he says. That's referencing Christian activism, Christian crusader arrogance, Christians who hold on to a form of the spiritual life, but deny its power. They're like the hamster running on a wheel. They run and run and run and run and run, and they get nowhere. And they're about as smart as a hamster. Verse 27. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. Striking a blow to the flesh is reference to rebound and keep moving, living not under the power of the flesh, but under the power of the Spirit. Then he continues, So that after I have preached to others, Paul preached for the most part under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. And Paul was not, and later on, in 2 Corinthians, he says that he has won the race. Freedom includes authority, and it includes authority for believer and unbeliever alike for the laws of divine establishment, the four divine institutions, recognize the sacredness of property, privacy, and life as the function of human freedom. Thus, the freedom of a nation is no more effective than the virtue, integrity, and sense of responsibility of all its citizens. Freedom and authority must coexist on the basis of integrity, the virtue and values attained by a nation in any given generation. And when a generation loses its virtue and its values, then comes judgment. For after judgment, if there is to be a recovery, after judgment, values return because people begin to see what is most important in life. And that's what God's judgment is for. Not out of hatred, not out of malice, but in order to wake people up to those virtues and values that are so important to the function of a nation. And if judgment comes upon this nation and we go under, Virtue and values from that judgment will pop up somewhere else because the whole world will go into a time of suffering. I was looking today at some scientific things as I was studying. I came across it. Do you know that the sun, approximately every 11 years, flips on its axis? In other words... It doesn't actually do a flip. But if you were to live on the sun, if you could, and you had a compass, our compass points north. Well, every 11 years, the sun flips, and then the compass points south. The magnetic field shifts. The same happens on Earth, they think, except at a much slower rate. And it hasn't happened since the time man has been here, so it probably never will happen. But they say Earth has a magnetic field, and also, too, that could happen, but that's theory. But it does happen on the sun. And what happens during a lot of these times is our sunspots, which we saw when uh, you saw that picture of the sun in the top half looked as if it wasn't emitting heat. Well, during this time, there are lots of sunspots. This time around, there seems to be more than usual. They use a scientific word for it that I didn't write down. 
but they indicated in the article that the sun has far more to do with our weather than we ever imagined. And that's quite shocking to hear from a scientist because you should immediately imagine the sun, our source of heat, has quite a great deal of influence on our climate. <laughs> but this is something they actually study. They say we might be entering a small ice age and they showed the graph showing the amount of magnetic activity falling to its lowest point since the time of the mini ice age that occurred during the dark ages. There seems to be a correlation between dark ages and very, very cold weather. Why? Less food. Famine. Well, they don't know for sure whether we are going to enter a mini ice age. But it would explain any cooler weather that we've had or might be to come. But that has not yet been proven. That's all in theory. <clears throat> so our, so uh, freedom and authority must coexist on the basis of integrity. The virtue and values attained by a nation in any, any, any generation. Our generation doesn't have many virtues or values. Our Constitution and the Bill of Rights outline this authority along with outlining the limitation, outlining the limitation of government in order to give maximum freedom to its citizens. Unfortunately, we don't follow these concepts anymore. So let's once again take a look at the Ten Amendments to the Constitution written by men of genius at a time in history where kings and tyrants reigned supreme throughout the world. And that had been history for all of history in the church age, even during Rome's time. The emperors were tyrants oftentimes, not always. So this document was not created by mere chance, but God in his omniscience brought together believer and unbeliever alike to create a document that reflects everything related to divine establishment principles and has been passed down to us as our heritage. Sadly, we as Esau have exchanged our heritage for a mess of pottage. Let's look at the Bill of Rights number one. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the people or of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now I'm going to read you an article from the Arizona, the, the Family Arizona newspaper, I believe, and actually also reported by Fox News Radio. A Phoenix man who held weekly Bible studies at his home has had the book thrown at him over the religious gatherings. Michael Salman has been sentenced to two months in jail and more than $12,000 in fines because the group sessions at his home were against the city's building code, Fox News Radio reported. Quote, they're cracking down on religious activities and religious use, Salman told Fox News Radio. They're attacking what I, as a Christian, do in the privacy of my home, end quote. Vicki Hill, Phoenix's chief assistant city prosecutor, said religious freedom had nothing to do with it and that it was a matter of public safety. Quote, Anytime you are holding a gathering of people continuously, as he does, we have concerns about people being able to exit the facility properly in case there is a fire, Hill told Fox News Radio. I'm sure she'd be very concerned over Christians being burned alive. Sounds more like she would enjoy that. It came down to zoning and proper permitting. Heil Hitler! Where are your papers? Where are your zoning papers? Where is your proper permitting? Heil Hitler! Arizona News continues. Since 2007, the Salman family has fought to say 
The building in their backyard is for private worship. Actually, he went ahead and built a 2,000 square foot building in his backyard. He had the permits for it and everything. And that is where he began to hold his Bible class. He moved it from the home. He went along with the authorities. Built with his own money, his own gathering place, on his own property of 2,000 square feet. The number of his congregation ranged from 15 to 20. About 15 people would attend the Bible studies, Fox News Radio reported. The city, the city complained that his home was not zoned for large meetings, so Solomon decided to build a 2,000 square foot building in his backyard. He said that he had applied for and was granted the appropriate permits for the building. When he didn't stop hosting the groups, the Phoenix Fire Department broke up a Good Friday gathering Solomon was hosting in 2008, 2008 in which there were as many as 20 people in the backyard. Whoa! How many of us have had a family gathering where there were 20 people or close to it or more? Lots of families do this. He didn't even meet every day. He met every week. And what's the fire department doing there when they're in the backyard? They're not in a building. Finally, in 2009, one dozen cops, 12 cops, raided Solomon's home and charged him with 67 code violations for hosting the gatherings. Since then, the courts have sided with the city, saying that Solomon was using the building as a church and therefore was subject to city zoning laws. And again, he had already requested for permits. Doesn't matter what kind of building it's used for, does it? But if it's for church, oh no, uh-uh. We already have enough of those, don't we? He built a structure that he said wasn't a church that is in fact a church, Hill, the prosecutor, told Fox News Radio. Don't know how much I would believe that or not. Still doesn't matter. Zoning's not in the Constitution as to where you can peaceably assemble or worship. In fact, the early church started in homes. Where are we? Are we living under Nero, where Christians are persecuted? In some areas, yes. Then the prosecutor goes on, as a lawyer would, with deceptive language. The state is not saying that the Salmons can't run a church or have worship services at the location. But the state is saying that if they do so, they must do it properly and in accord with zoning laws. Heil! Salmon doesn't buy the court's argument and has claimed that Phoenix officials are discriminating against him for his religious beliefs. Quote, If I had people coming to my home on a regular basis for poker night or Monday night football, it would be permitted, he told Fox News Radio. But when someone says to us, we are not allowed to gather because of religious purposes, that is when you have discrimination. That's how we word it. he words it. How I word it is that's when you violate the law of the land, the Constitution of the United States. A man's everything in the First Amendment was violated in this case. Well, let's read Amendment 2. Or I'll read it. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The definition of infringe means to encroach or to break a law. The federal government, along with states' governments and municipalities, are breaking the law when they encroach either by gun registration or outright confiscation. Our government has broken the law of the land, the Constitution of the United States, and the Second Amendment. 
Here's an article, the headline. Guns of law-abiding husband confiscated after wife's single voluntary mental health visit. March 12, 2013 at 5.50 p.m. by Liz Klimas. Just last week, the California Senate approved a $24 million funding bill to expedite the process of collecting guns from owners in the state who legally acquire them but have since become disqualified due to felony convic convictions or mental illness. Such was recently the case for one woman who had been in the hospital voluntarily for mental illness last year that she says was due to medication she was taking. Lynette Phillips of Upland, California told The Blaze in a phone interview Monday she had purchased a gun years ago for her husband, David, as a present. That gun, as well as two others registered to her law-abiding husband, who does not have a history of felonies or mental illness, were seized last Tuesday. Quote, My husband is upset that they took the right from us that should have never been taken, Phillips told the blaze. But according to the state of California, that doesn't matter, and neither does the Second Amendment, obviously. Now, I added that. Quote, the, prohib the prohibited person can't have access to a firearm, end quote, regardless of who the registered owner is, Michelle Gregory, a spokeswoman for the Eternal General's office, told to Bloomberg News as she bountied about her SS uniform. That was sarcasm. According to the Los Angeles Times last week, Budget cuts created a backlog of 19,000 people in the state with more than 40,000 guns that they are no longer legally allowed to own. Baloney. Such a prohibited armed persons file is created through the office of the Attorney General. When a person is entered into the automated criminal history system, the Consolidated Firearms Information System is also checked to see if they might have possession of a gun. The same check is conducted for those involuntarily admitted into the hospital for mental illness as well. There is something in federal law called HIPAA. It's a privacy act that we don't, even, we don't follow anymore. The state has no rights to get its grubby hands on someone's medical records. If George Washington could roll over in his grave and come back, he would sue us for calling him a father. Bloomberg reported that nine police, with the state's Department of Justice wearing bulletproof vests and carrying Glocks, nine police to a law-abiding citizen's home. His wife, poor lady, had a mental illness. So what? It happened. Someone in your family gets a mental illness and all of a sudden you have nine policemen knocking at your door. What is this? In what country am I living? Nine police officers. Why, they would make you feel like a criminal when you're not one. Actually, they treated him like a criminal when he wasn't one. Well, they went there with nine police, with the State Department of Justice wearing bulletproof vests and bulletproof vests and wearing and carrying Glocks, went to homes on March 5th to retrieve the guns from people who, under this law, not under the law of the Constitution, the law of the land, but under this law, were no longer allowed to own. The Phillips family was one of them. Phillips told the Blaze the authorities arrived in unmarked cars Tuesday night around 8 p.m. Seeing as how she had never been in trouble with the law before, when they asked to enter, she said sure, not thinking to ask for a warrant. This gun confiscation law doesn't go so far as to give officers warrants to enter property without permission. 
Phillips explained that she and her husband were seated at their dining room table and questioned about the firearms. Phillips showed authorities where the weapons were located, a handgun in the top dresser drawer, and two rifles in a safe in the garage. In a safe! After Phillips unlocked the case in the garage, she said officers pulled her away from the guns and back into the house. They weren't mean, Phillips said. I know they were just doing their job. A good law-abiding citizen, a humble person, obviously. But it's a job, Phillips said, that never should have had to be done in the first place. Amen to that. Phillips told the Blaze she had an adjustment to her medication in December and could not stop crying. Her personal psychiatrist suggested she go to Aurora Charter Oak Hospital in Covina, California, where she said she was admitted voluntarily, not involuntarily, which is their law, not a threat to herself or others. Then, when she reviewed her file, Phillips said the nurse had recorded that she was involuntarily admitted and indicated she might be a suicide risk. Philip claims the nurse had put words into her mouth. That happens all the time. Quote, I kept telling her I had a grandbaby at home and had to be better for Christmas, she said. Does that sound like the words of someone who is a risk to themselves and others? Phillips believes and noted online reviews of the center should substantiate her claims that the process at the psychiatric hospital was a joke. Bloomberg contacted the hospital for a response regarding Phillips' admittance, but had not received a reply. Still, the issue of patients potentially being misdiagnosed speaks of the larger implication of the laws that might apply following such a hospital admittance. What a bunch of nonsense. We should simply follow the Constitution. Quote, let's see if we can't prevent this from happening to someone else, Phillips said, calling what has happened since she was in the hospital a snowballing effect. I do feel I have every right to purchase a gun, she told Bloomberg. I'm not a threat. We're law-abiding citizens. She also pointed out the length of time it took before authorities had come to collect the firearms. This happened in December, Phillips said. I asked them at what point were they notified. They said between 24 to 48 hours after I was in the hospital. As Phillips pointed out, if she were truly a risk to herself or others, the authorities didn't claim the guns in timely fashion. Timeliness could be what the state Senate's new funds for the collection of such firearms could be for. Some disagree, though, with where the new money is coming from. According to the LA Times, the $24 million would make would be made over three years from a fee paid for by, for by those registering their guns in the state. Gun registration is an infringement. It is a violation of the Second Amendment, of the Constitution, of the law of our land. According to state records, around 2,000 firearms, 117,000 rounds of ammunition, and 11,000 magazines were collected under the law last year. As for the Phillips family being re reinstated with their firearms, she said they have to wait 30 days while an investigation is underway before she can appear in front of a judge who will determine her competency. What they are investigating, I have no idea. Quote, that's what she said. Uh, the Third Amendment, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So far we have followed this one amendment, but we do, by the way, ever since the 1990s, we do have international forces that come in on American soil and do joint operations with the United States, and I'm not talking about just our allies. We have joint operations with Russia. We've had joint operations with China. We've had joint operations with our enemies. Over 100,000 and up to 200,000 troops from foreign lands have trained on American soil. They bring in their foreign tanks 
but so far no soldiers have been quarantined in a house. You might want to ask yourself why are we doing that? Internationalism. Number four, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Of course, this is flagrantly disregarded for no reason whatsoever. Soever. Your person is strip searched at the airport. Personal items deemed not appropriate are confiscated without recompense. If you're pulled over and you tell the police officer you don't want him to search your car or your trunk for a simple traffic violation, he'll make you sit there until you cave in or intimidate you in some way until you open that car and let him look in. Now you say, well, I don't have anything to hide. That's fine, but the principle is of it, and I would let him look because I don't have anything to hide either, but the principle of it is it's a constitutional right. You don't have a right to go through your things, your property, what's on your person, your possessions. It's all right there in the Fourth Amendment. Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger nor shall any person be sub subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, life or property, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Every one of those has been violated. The very fact that we do have double jeopardy in this country, the very fact that we have federal law makes that possible. The, when the Constitution was written they never thought of having federal criminal law. They thought the states would handle criminal matters. So now they have a federal law against murder and a state law against murder. If you uh, if a jury says you are not guilty in the state, the federal government can still come after you. That's double jeopardy, a violation of the Constitution of the United States. When it comes to private property and the fact that government shall not seize it, this has been happening for quite some time. It especially was escalated during the 1990s. And after the election of the Republican Congress in 1994, they decided to bring it to the House on February 10, 1995. Here we have the testimony of Roger Pylon from the Cato Institute, and at the time, this was a big deal, we don't remember it anymore, of course, too long ago. But this is at the Subcommittee on Constitutional Committee on Judiciary, United States House of Representatives. And this is what Roger Pylon from the Cato Institute had to say just a portion of it. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, my name is Roger Pylon. I am a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and the director of Cato Center for Constitutional Studies. I want to begin by thanking Congressman Hyde for inviting me to speak before the subcommittee on the subject of protecting private property rights from regulatory takings. Regulatory takings. And that's what, it, that's what it's called. Um, they don't just come out and outright confiscate your land because then they have to pay you. But they can regulate you from doing things on your land to make your land less valuable. That's what's called a regulatory taking. I want also to thank blah, 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 and blah, 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 where they go through the thanking. Uncompensated regulatory takings of private property have become an immense problem across the nation, still is, as federal, state, and local regulations have increased in number and scope 
property owners have increasingly found themselves unable to use their property and unable to recover the losses that result. The problem begins, therefore, with the growth of government regulations that deny owners the legitimate use of their property. It should end with the relief that courts might give in the form of compensation to those owners as required by the Fifth Amendment's taking clause. Unfortunately, the courts have been locked into what the Supreme Court itself has called 70-odd years of ad hoc regulatory takings jurisprudence. As a result, they give relief in only a limited range of cases. That means that property owners, both large and small, bear the full cost of the public goods the regulations bring about, when in all fairness those costs should be borne by the public that orders those goods in the first place. The Fifth Amendment's takings clause reads, quote, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, end quote. As presently interpreted by the court, that clause enables owners to receive compensation when their entire estate is taken by a government agency and title transfers to the government. When their proper property is physically invaded by government order, either permanently or temporarily, when regulation for other than health or safety reasons takes all or nearly all of the value of the property, and when government attaches unreasonable or disproportionate permit conditions on use. Although that list of protections might seem extensive, a moment's reflection should indicate the problem, and it's a very large one. Most regulations do not reduce the value of a person's property to zero or near zero. Rather, they reduce the value by 25%, 50%, or some other fraction of the whole. In those circumstances, the vast majority of circumstances, the owner gets nothing. Only if he is, quote, lucky enough to be completely wiped out by a regulation does he receive compensation. He goes on and on as a scholar, but I don't have the, I have time restraints. Number six, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the eyewitnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Both prosecution and defense are too quick nowadays to, in which they want to come up with some nefarious deals and there's too much deal making go on going on nefarious deal making that goes on in which uh, a person does not really get to go before a jury uh, they do many unfair things with regard to the this deal making and I don't believe our forefathers envisioned, envisioned anything like that and if the party is guilty Oftentimes, through deal making, he'll get away with murder. If the party is innocent, oftentimes he's forced into a situation of taking a deal, especially on those matters regarding something like a simple misdemeanor, because they carry such light sentences. He would rather take the lighter sentence, even though not guilty, than to face a person who's in accusation, who they know, if caught in a lie, won't even be charged with perjury, but their lie might even stand up in court. So all of this, no system's perfect, but actually the problem is no system of law, even though ours is still the best in the world, no system of law is greater than the integrity of those that enforce that law. So that shows why we don't follow the Sixth Amendment exactly though we do a pretty good job. Number seven, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rule of the common law. We follow our common laws pretty well because uh, it's a simple type deal. Number eight, 
Excessive trial shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Well, I believe that pastor in California that we noted earlier, I think that that would be some undue punishment. In fact, he shouldn't have been punished at all. It was definitely excessive punishment. Two months in jail for what? Having church? For following his First Amendment right? He went to jail. That should burn your hide up. It burns mine up. But we, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, should expect to be persecuted. Especially now that we've gone so far away from establishment principles and away from the Constitution and the Bill of Rights on which this country was founded. We are in terrible shape, if you can't see, by the fact that we're following almost none of these. Number nine, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, these ten amendments are not the only rights we have. All other rights that can be conceived by man are still retained by the people. You see, they were putting in a rule of law, that's all. And the laws, by the way, do what? Limit the federal government. Why? Those who are power hungry become the worst of all criminals. They need to be reined in. So all other rights are retained by the people, not the federal government. Number 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. And there we have states' rights, which really don't exist anymore. Texas tries to push around some states' rights, but even they cave in on occasion. Now what I just read you, even just from the Bill of Rights, is a brilliant document. It's the most brilliant document since the Mosaic Law. It's the most brilliant document for a government ever in the church age. Period. And we are taking that freedom and exchanging it for a mess of pottage. Throwing it away. Let's take a look at what the top leader in our land has to say about the Constitution. After all, when a president is sworn in, they place their hand on the Constitution, or on the Bible. They place their hand on the Bible, and they swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States. I'm going to quote him directly. This isn't my word. As radical as I think people try to characterize the Warren Court, it wasn't that radical. It didn't break free from the essential constraints that were placed by the Founding Fathers in the Constitution, at least as it's been interpreted. And more important, interpreted in the same way that generally the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties. It says what the states can't do to you. It says what the federal government can't do to you. But it doesn't say what the federal government or the state government must do on your behalf. And that hasn't shifted. And one of the, I think, tragedies of the civil rights movement was because the civil rights movement became so court-focused I think that there was a tendency to lose track of the political and community organizing and activities on the ground that are able to put together the actual coalitions of power through which you bring about redistributive change. And in some ways, we still suffer from that." End quote. Now this is no idiot. You can tell by his vocabulary. He said these things. These weren't even written down. He has, a math, he has a wide vocabulary. Why he thought there was 57 states, I don't know. 
Maybe he'd gotten drunk the night before. But, I'm just joking. But, it's no idiot. But obviously he doesn't believe in our Constitution. He says so right here. If you want to know what he's saying, ask me after class. I don't have time to go into it now. It's not really that important. I'm just showing you the way and the direction in which our country is going. And Barack Obama is not the first president not to like the Constitution. He's one of many. Started with Woodrow Wilson. Continued under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Lyndon Johnson had no, no idea of what the Constitution meant. He, forget him. Richard Nixon, he didn't have any idea about our rights under the Constitution. Jimmy Carter definitely didn't like our Constitution. Not just Barack Obama. We've had a, of late in modern times, a history of presidents who give an oath and wag with their mouth to follow the Constitution, but do not. In fact, in many cases such as this, they disagree with it. That's why people like Dwight D. Eisenhower said, only Americans can hurt America. Abraham Lincoln said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Now why did I just go through that again, the Bill of Rights, and gave you examples? It is because we're studying freedom, and it is part of our heritage. And we do live in current time, so I'm bringing you biblical concepts to experience. And you say, well, what about the future generation that might hear something from you? They're not going to know anything about it. Look, history repeats itself. Same type things happen again and again. So while just, uh, studying our spiritual heritage and, and also studying the source of human freedom, there's no way I couldn't pass up on the Constitution. No way. Well, mankind, of course, was created by God and placed on the earth to re resolve the prehistoric angelic conflict. Let me see what time I have going here. Just one moment. I got to change the settings on this monitor or something. Well, it's about time to close, so turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Romans 13, 1. As you turn there, I'll go ahead and give you some concepts, some principles. Mankind was created by God and placed on earth to resolve the prehistoric angelic conflict. And of course we know the big picture that I brought out concerning the fact of how Jesus Christ loved history so much that in eternity past he created Satan knowing that he would choose to fall. He created mankind knowing that he would choose to fall and knowing that as a result of giving them that freedom he would have to die on the cross as a substitute for us and that's phenomenal. That's how important freedom is and privacy and every principle that goes along with it. And really the only thing we have in common with the angels is freedom or free will. So principle one, privacy is the environment of human freedom. Principle one, privacy is the environment of human freedom. Principle two, Property is the expression of human freedom. Principle number two, property is the expression of human freedom. Number three, ownership is the manifestation of human freedom. Number three, ownership is the manifestation of human freedom. So number one, privacy is the environment of human freedom. Number two, property is the expression of human freedom. And number three, ownership is the manifestation of human freedom. Now I've just given you many cases of bad law and the fact that we are not following our Constitution anymore. 
That does not give you a right to become an activist. It does not give you a right to go into crusader arrogance and try to change things and turn the clock back to a time when we did follow the Constitution. You don't have the power in the flesh to do so. The only thing you can do is live your spiritual life. And your spiritual life has more impact than anything you could ever do in the flesh. So while it might burn you up like it burns me up, while it might make your blood boil, it should only make your blood boil that much more for taking in the Word of God because that's the only hope. And you're a current event, and you can change these things by executing the protocol plan of God. So in spite of bad law, in spite of a general lack of integrity when it comes to the fact that law-abiding citizens are being made into criminals, we must follow what Paul says in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. I'll read it, I'll let you know what it means, and we'll close. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Verse 3, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Paul is addressing the criminal. Do you want to be free? Don't you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? It's a rhetorical question. Of course you do. Then do what is right, and you will be commended. Verse 4, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword, capital punishment, for no reason. Now don't overthink this passage. It's easy to do. There are always exceptions. For example, Paul was an exception. He, died, he was to be martyred by the authorities. In fact, he was martyred by Emperor Nero. So there are exceptions. Capital punishment came to the greatest man, the greatest believer ever, but that was part of his martyrdom, a part of God's plan for his life. And martyrdom, even in those cultures, is rare. Even in the culture of the Roman Empire, it only happened to those who were most fervent in their faith. Most people are not, even though saved. So they don't get a crown but a lot, a few people were so fervent in their faith and so far along spiritually that they would be beheaded, as Paul was, and he will receive the ultimate crowns. The crown of martyrdom, as it's called, but really, it'll be the crown of righteousness that Paul will receive. And every martyr, if you are martyred as a Christian for your faith in Christ, you receive all the rewards that are possible for one to receive. So don't overthink it and say, now wait a minute, people have been executed for no reason. It's true, but it's an exception. So do not overthink. They are God's servants, Paul goes on to say, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. If honor, then honor. If respect, respect. What does that mean? You should never call a police officer a pig. I don't care how unfair the system in which you live or how unfair you've been treated in the past sporadically by a police officer. There's always jerks in every organization. But they wear uniform of authority and that demands respect and honor. And if you call a police officer a pig or show disrespect to a police officer because of the actions of a few, or even if they're all acting crazy, they're still an authority. 
but they're not all acting crazy. Most are honorable, I think. But if not, doesn't matter. You give them honor, you give them respect, because it's not about you. It's about the maintenance of law for bad law is better than no law. Respect it. That's what the Bible tells us to do. Verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. This means that when functioning under the integrity of impersonal love, you fulfill the law by not reacting to injustice. And thus you are functioning under your very own spiritual life which guards you against committing those sins which violate the divine establishment of freedom. And then Paul goes on to give us some of the commandments. Why? They protect us and they protect our freedom. Verse 9, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, theft of a wife. You shall not murder, theft of a life. You shall not, shall not steal, theft of money, property, etc. You shall not covet, envy, lust, jealousy, covet. That's where socialism comes from, the bowels of hell, right from Satan's cosmic system. You shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is a function of love derived from your confidence developed under the concept of a personal sense of destiny. A personal sense of destiny motivates one in the area of personal love for God and thus by extension motivates one in regards to developing impersonal love for all mankind. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Even if you're wronged by a neighbor, you do not react. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, the integrity envelope of personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for all mankind, wrapped up in the concept of sharing the love of God, fulfills the law since the Christian way of life, your unique spiritual life, develops a higher integrity than merely following the law or divine establishment principles. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what we've gone over. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.